It's a high tech conversation on the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Welcome everybody to, to Bench Talk 101. Uh, as, uh, as you all know, we've been uh, doing this now for, for 12 weeks. Um, it all started off with COVID and getting together and, and being able to talk about uh, woodwork and, and helping each other out. Um, and it's been really, really quite good to see over the weeks because, um, you know, uh, we've had uh, people from America sending stuff over to England to be repaired. Um, so if you've looked at uh, Jim's uh, 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 post this week on, on Instagram, he's got this great, uh, great knob that he's uh, given to, uh, to Chester. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about his knob later on. Um, but uh, it's, it's people from, from all around the world, um, you know, joining us, which is, which is really quite nice. Um, the, the sort of screen time is getting more and more. Chris Swartz, um, currently over 3,000 views on, on his video. Richard Hughes, um, 2,400 views. Um, and then last week, obviously, big thank you to Phil Edwards um, for talking about his plane um, and, and how to make a plane from one single piece of wood. Um, Bill, Bill and Sarah can't make it tonight, but they have asked, you know, they've said to say hello to everybody. And they've, they've said that basically they've, um, they've posted some, uh, some uh, snippets of film onto the uh, 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 Facebook and, and different places that you can see about making a four inch box um, wood uh, plane. So if, if you're interested in that, have a look at that um, um, for them. But um, tonight's speaker is, is, is uh, Derek. Um, and we all know Derek in, in different ways. Um, I've known Derek now for about six years when I attended a course that he organized um, down in, down in uh, Somerset uh, in Bridgewater. Uh, basically he had uh, Chris Schwartz there doing a uh, sort of a Dutch anarchist tool chest, you know, rough and ready thing. Um, and then uh, David Barron doing a really smooth, um, fine dovetail course. Um, and, and I kind of met Derek then and sort of, you know, started to, to quiz him and, and, you know, really get to know him. And, and over the years, he's told me about his, his careers. Um, he's been a furniture restorer. He's, been, he's made furniture, bespoke furniture for people like Microsoft, the Bank of Canada, passport offices, and a numerous prestigious private um, installations. Um, and then he went into being an editor. And he's done 10 years as the editor of Furniture and Cabinet Making Magazine. And he finished that uh, in, in the summer of, of uh, uh, last year. And he's now doing sort of courses, running courses um, all over the world, whether it's at America or, or in the UK. Um, and I know he hopes to, to, to get out uh, more when the COVID is, is, uh, is kind of gone. But I know that uh, today he did his first course um, down in Robin, Robinson Studio. Maybe he'll tell us a bit more about that later. Um, but he did 10 years with that and came out. Um, he's been doing the uh, London International Woodworking Festival. And, and now he actually also teaches design at the London Design and Engineering UTC. So today he's going to talk to us all about old school marking gauges um, and how he pimps them up. So what I'd like you all to do is if you go to speak of you, you can see Derek in his finest. Um, stay on mute and, and give him sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. Uh, he'll, he'll talk about his new uh, pimped up marking gauge. Um, and... Uh, and then ask, I'll answer your questions afterwards. Derek, over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I know we've had a few, uh, um, a few exchanges already, but for those who've just joined, thank you very much for, for um, tuning in. So tonight, as Jeffrey said, I'm going to talk you through my thought process, how I came up with my style of traditional marking gauges. Um, there are a few eureka moments uh, along the way. But it really started out with this really, this first rather sort of crude attempt at making a marking gauge. And I really don't know why I wanted to make a marking gauge. I just knew that um, when I had some downtime editing the magazine, I used to fiddle about and make things that some of them were intended as, as uh, articles for the magazines. Others were just to keep myself occupied and uh, um, sort of playing around. But I came up with this first style of a, a marking gauge. And if I just take the pencil out the far end, that off of there. And you can see that straight away, my first iteration, and I, I do love the actual process of design, sort of coming up with an idea and changing it and improving it and using it for a while and just making slight changes. And that whole um, iterative design process is something that, uh, that fascinates me. So you can see this first attempt 
um, I had that sort of that nice sort of uh, traditional shape across the top and these little sort of moldings on the side and straight away I realized as nice as they are uh, and they're lovely to have in, in, in a gauge in any sort of tool they're actually a bit of a pig to make and, and I realized that if I, I'd never really, I never sort of stop at making one of anything, whatever I make, whether it's, it's sort of tables, chairs, boxes, I always like to get into the rhythm and sort of find better ways of, of, of sort of making whatever design or sort of style I'm, I'm, I'm working with, sort of proving the, uh, uh, the making process. And I realized very quickly, but that in actual fact, as nice as it is, it was actually quite difficult to replicate with hand tools. And for me, it was important then to, uh, to make this with as many hand tools and sort of put um, um, uh, industrial machinery to one side and uh, do as much, as, uh, much of it as I could um, by hand. So that was my first attempt at uh, a stop for a marking gauge. You can see it's square. That was just pierced out with, um, with a mortise machine, nothing fancy there. It wasn't an attempt to make it uh, a precision fit or anything. Uh, wood doesn't really lend itself to precision fits anyway, in my opinion, but um, that's maybe that's a topic for discussion uh, uh, another time. But um, the bar I put in there, was a regular sort of square section bar. And you can see what I did. I think that was my first wedge. See, they're good and proper. And the first blade I made to go in this marking gauge was just an old hacksaw blade that was uh, had the teeth ground off uh, and flattened on, on one side. And then this sort of rather, if I can show that you can see that's against my face, you can see that it's a slightly curved or, or cambered blade. And it, it kind of works okay, but even so, it wasn't, uh, it didn't perform as well as I, I wanted it to. And then I decided that uh, if I was going to take this, this idea any further, I should really do a little bit more research. And I already had quite a collection of marking gauges. I've got some that are very, very precise. I've got some wheel gauges. I've got a couple of nice marking gauges from Jeff Hamilton. That's a really nice, sweet little gauge. I've got several wheel gauges. But the thing that fascinated me the most, and the ones I love using the most, are the traditional gauges, and I've got several of them. Um, and I bought a job lot of marking gauges, really, just to do some research um, um, uh, at auction. And it was a box of about nine or ten different marking gauges. It all had slightly different quirks, but I think apart from one or two that were user-made gauges, they all had exactly the same dimension stocks. There was nothing unique or different about them at all, and it, it kind of felt to me as if when whoever we designed and came up with a, a, a pattern for the traditional wooden marking gauge we got to a certain set of dimensions and thought that's it we've done it we didn't go any further and everything to within a millimeter or so was exactly the same shape and size and that really bugged me to be perfectly honest and I kind of wondered why we hadn't progressed any further especially knowing what I know about students and people when they pick up a marking gauge for the first time the problems they have using what to me, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you guys, is actually quite an easy tool to use. But you'd be surprised how many people, when they first pick one of these up, it's sort of new, uh, new people to the craft, really struggle with the concept of, of using a marking gauge. I didn't think too long and hard about it because I, I kind of guess I already had the answer anyway. And I think it's because, especially as, as blokes, we we're very um, much guided by what we can see, I believe. If we can't see it happening, we don't believe it's happening. We can't fathom it out. There's, the cogs start turning and we just can't make things, um, uh, things just don't really sort of compute unless we can see what's happening. So I changed the format. I changed the proportions and the size of my stem for my marking gauge. If I hold that one up there, which is pretty much the same size, you can see, there we are. I think that does it there's a vast difference in profile and size. And admittedly, this felt like I was wielding an RSJ. I mean, it's a massive piece of wood to suddenly think that's a mark engagement. All I've been used to all my working career is that sort of, you know, 20 mil by, by 20 by 28, something like that is, is a rough sort of measurement for mark engage. And it felt kind of chunky, but after a while, I really got used to it and, and you know, and, and enjoy using it. And what it does, by having that, um, that complete radius there, as opposed to just a shallow curve, it does mean, and I'm going to tilt my computer down. Don't worry, I'm not going to go too far. There we are. It does mean that when I lay my marking gauge down, I can still see the pin. If I'm looking from over this direction, I can still actually see the pin and what it's doing in reference to whatever 
is uh, to the headstock that's balanced up, that's, uh, that's pinched or, or sort of set on the beam. And if I go to the second version I had, I made it so that the pin, back again, I made it so the pin in actual fact this time is a little bit longer, sticks out a bit further. So it's even better when you roll that down, stay with me folks, when you get that on your, your work surface or whatever you're marking, I can run that across the edge of my bench or whatever I'm marking and I can see the pin, I can see exactly what it's doing. And I found that when I hand this tool and don't say anything to anybody to see why it's that shape, that sort of size, they have far fewer mistakes, far fewer problems. I think it's because they can actually see what the pin's doing in relation to the task it's being asked to perform and that critical surface there. That's the important bit. It's a little bit like sawing. You wouldn't ever attempt to saw to a line unless you could actually see the line. So it's a little bit counterintuitive to, or, or a little bit much to expect people to be able to gauge a line if they can't actually see what it's doing. And a lot of marking gauges, the, um, the sweet spot, what's happening is just hidden from view. So that's what led me to making my, uh, the marking gauge that sort of shape and size. Now, the other thing, and when I was um, um, uh, at the magazine, I used to spend a lot of time on the phone, have massive, great big long phone calls. Um, and I can't remember who I was on the phone to at the time, but they were going on and on and on. And some people doodle on the phone. I fiddle, I tap, like most of us do. I always find something to occupy myself when I'm on the phone. And I had a nut and bolt that was sitting on the bench and I had a wooden pencil. And I'm sure a lot of you have actually seen the, uh, um, the, the video that I post usually once a year whenever I'm making the next batch of marking gauges. And I came up with the idea of, of drilling a nice big hole in the end of my marking gauge. And then I run an M8, a bit of M8 threaded bar straight through there. I don't bother actually uh, cutting out with, uh, with, with a, a tap and die set. I just run the, um, the M8 bar through there and do exactly the same with my wooden pencil. I chuck, when I say chuck, I mean chuck on a drill. I chuck my pencil into a small uh, cordless and I just whiz that straight through an M8 nut. And that creates enough of a thread around the outside of my pencil. So that when I want to turn my marking gauge into a pencil gauge, I can just screw that in there. It's a bit tight. There you go, you can poke it out. Twist, there we are, that'll do. And I can set that almost to any depth that I like. It can be really fine. I've got some fine adjust if I want to go a little bit deeper. But it works an absolute treat. Now, when I actually make these uh, for sale, I do actually tap that out and make that a little bit more accurate because it does, it can sort of jam up. And the most important thing is you know that if you buy pencils, buy pencils, whoever bought a pencil from um, Ikea or the betting shop, if they're already still open or um, screw fix or anywhere like that, you know that you can just run one of these through an M8 nut and it'll fit straight through your marking gauge, turning it into a pencil gauge. Now that was, that was one of those sort of eureka moments. And I don't know why it took me almost sort of 30 years to work out. That's, that's the best thing you can do with a, with a free pencil and, and a nut and bolt. But whoever it was I was on the phone to, I got a feeling it might've been a plane maker from Scotland, but uh, I'll have to go back and, and check my records on that. But anyway, that's, that's um, a feature that has stayed with me with my, uh, all my marking gauges even now. So I've been producing these probably for um, two, three years now, I think. And in the back of my mind, I always knew that I wanted to go back to the original marking gauge that had uh, a knife cutter and uh, sorry, um, um, a knife as the blade. And these obviously have pins and the pins, if you're not familiar with these, these marking gauge, the pin is actually um, a ne an old gramophone needle. They're nicely polished. They're easy to get. If you drill a 1.5 millimeter hole, you can put these in with enough friction for them not to fall out. If you do need to take them out, just get a pair of pliers, grip hold them, slight little twist, you can pull them out and replace them. If you find, if it snaps off, I've never known anybody snap one off yet, but if you have any problems with it, you can just drill another hole further up the stem uh, and away you go and put a new one in. If you ever have any problems finding those gramophone needles, then come and find me and I'll easily gladly put some in the post but they're quite easy to, uh, um, to buy. So I knew that I wanted to go back to making, uh, uh, to putting a, a knife in my gauge. Uh, but one thing that always troubled me or I found difficult was actually finding somebody who would make the cutters, the blades for me. 
and I approached quite a few, some well-known blade makers, and they always seemed far too busy. Maybe they didn't take me seriously. Maybe the numbers I was asking for were either too many or too few. They just didn't seem to be that interested. So the whole project kind of um, sort of ground to a halt um, um, you know, maybe sort of six months ago, and I just sort of left it and didn't do anything else about it until I bought a nice little marking knife like this. Um, Swiss made. It came from, I think I bought that from uh, Dictum in Germany. Uh, and I found this a really, really nice little marking gauge. It's so precise. And I used to use it, in actual fact, if I take that off of there. Sometimes I use a chisel, sometimes I use these knives. But when I've actually put, um, if I can hold that up there, when I put a chamfer around that edge here, I can use my knife, turn it around that way, and I just pare away those little corners with this knife. And it's actually quite nice. You can use it like a pencil. It's very delicate, very precise. And I can work almost like a jeweler, trimming those corners and making those look really nice. And I suddenly thought, well, do you know what? That wouldn't, that wouldn't make a, a, bad, a bad blade for a marking knife. I'm not too keen on the angles. And it's sharpened or it's beveled on both sides. That needs to be improved. So a little bit of research. And I located another similar type of uh, knife um, made and supplied, well, made uh, in France, badged up as a, a hock blade. Now I've got several hock blades in planes. Uh, they've always served me well. Um, so I bought a little um, six mil diameter, six mil diameter, six mil hock blade, which is one like that. And it actually comes, I think they come in with a, a spear point, which is that you know, if I hold that up, can you see, can everybody see that? Is that good? Uh, they come with that, whoops, wrong side. Use my middle finger. Um, uh, they actually come with this, this spear point in there, which is okay as a marking or a, a cutting gauge knife, but it's a little bit severe. Those, these tips are so fragile and, and a marking gauge tends to um, have to put up with quite a lot of pressure and a lot of use, something that you wouldn't necessarily use with a, a blade or a marking knife of that size. So I got my Dremel out and I cut the, um, the first sort of, what is that? The first sort of two inches off. And that was one blade with the, the original spear point on there. And what was left was the rest of this. And I think these are A2 blades. Um, let me turn it around that way, A2 blades. And I decided that um, to, to look at the way I used my marking knife and my cutting knives and just see what kind of angle I, um, I typically used to decide what to, uh, um, how to grind that angle there. Um, and one of the things that, that, does, that has always bothered me with marking knives, and I've got several, I've got some Japanese ones and I've got these ones, and I've got some other sort of smaller ones on, on the top there. And I've got some really nice um, uh, marking knives that have scalpel type blades in there. And I love them, they're absolutely fantastic when you get them. About a year after you've used them, they get dull because I kind of rotate them. And I've never ever, maybe it's just me, but I've never ever been able to return them back to anything like as sharp as they were on the day I bought them. So that's always bothered me a little bit. And okay, sure, you can put them on the edge of a stone and sharpen them up again, but I've, I'm not a big fan of, of sort of freehand sharpening anyway. Sharpening is something that I want to get over and done with quickly. To me, sharpening is, is the equivalent of washing up. And quite frankly, I've got a dishwasher for that. So I don't really want to spend that much time sharpening. I just want a bit of plug in, dial in the numbers, get it sharp and get the tools back on the wrap so I can make them blunt again. That's kind of what I do in the workshop. I don't really want to spend my time sharpening. I want to spend my time making them blunt. So I go back to um, a problem I had uh, before that and I tuned into the Lee Nielsen honing guide. Now I know honing guides aren't everybody's cup of tea. I like the Lee Nielsen honing guide. Uh, I've had several eclipses over the years and they work perfectly well, but I always found that setting the depth on those was a little bit hit and miss. And before I even started making marking gauges, I used to use, uh, uh, when I was teaching my classes, I used to use a board that had the, the stop so you could gauge those depths nice and easy. Um, nothing uncommon about those. And I'll get one of these behind me. I hold that up. That's what I use to set all my uh, my, my depths for my uh, used to be for my clips. This one, in actual fact, now is is for the um, 
um, is, is for the Lee Nielsen. And what you do, you put your blades in your, your device like that. I'm going to tip you down so you can see what I'm doing. And then move that in there, or loosen that, slot that in there, and you can put that up against whatever stop you've got and that will give you the correct projection for that angle, okay? All those measurements uh, are recorded on the, on the Lee Nielsen literature that comes with the honing guide. So it's not difficult, it's not impossible to fathom out yourself. But one of the problems I had, um, I had a Veritas skew rebate plane. If anyone's familiar with that, the Veritas skew rebate plane, there it is. Nice skew blade on it put a little fence on one side, fantastic little plane, use it an awful lot for taking off uh, material and doing rebates. But again, I find it really awkward trying to sharpen that. And there's one thing, is, um, um, a rebate plane or any kind of plane, I guess, really, but these really do have to be precision sharpened and kept sharp. Uh, they just don't, just don't uh, function at all. And I found that really difficult to achieve. So I bought myself, the left and right set of jaws. And if you're familiar with the, the Lee Nielsen system, you can actually buy interchangeable jaws. This one's actually um, geared up for the blade in my marking gauge. But these, these jaws that go on the front, you can change those to take um, uh, mortise chisels, straight chisels, plain lines, all kinds of things. They're interchangeable, do lefts and rights and different angles. So I bought them left and right. Uh, and I took the two jaws down to my local uh, engineering company just down the road from me in New Haven. I said, hey, can you machine me two grooves down there? I know this is already set up. I think they were set up for 30 degrees. Can you machine them at 20 degrees? And the guys looked at me and said, well, yes, it's, it's not difficult. What was difficult, and they found an absolute nightmare, was finding a way to hold them because the jaws themselves are really quite small and milling those angles isn't difficult. But finding a tool to hold them is what they, they, they you know, said was the hardest part of it. So they recut these. They, so we went from a 30 degrees to a 20 degrees, which is what the skewed angle is on, uh, on the Veritas rebate plane. So you can see if I put those up there, that's actually marked up. And this will only sharpen 20 degrees. This will only sharpen the... Is that coming out backwards to everybody? I can assure you it says Veritas, but um, it actually, <laughs> these will only sharpen my, my Veritas um, blade in that, that there. So it got me thinking that if I can use this same system cobbled together with my honing depth gauge, uh, I could actually come up with quite a nice system of supplying and uh, a means of sharpening the blades for uh, the marking gauge, or what we should really sort of refer to now as a cutting gauge, because it's actually, it cuts rather than just sort of gouges um, a, a trough with a pin. So that's exactly what I did. Um, by a coincidence, uh, that angle there, wrong one, that angle there is actually close to, is that in actual fact across the top is 20 degrees. And it just so happens that, um, um, sorry, it's not 20 degrees, it's actually, it's 30 degrees, but it just so happens that 30 degrees is, read my list, yep, that's exactly what the Lee Nielsen um, jaws will, will give you. So all you know, need to do now is this to work out how long this needs to be to project the right distance to enable you to sharpen this on your diamond stones, your water stones, whatever method you have. I very rarely use a grinder, certainly don't use a tormek. Um, I've sort of steered away from any sharpening systems to have water in. It's not that I'm um, adverse to using water or water stones. I just don't have running water in my shop. So it's a real pain in the butt. And quite often when you go on site uh, or go to um, other places to, to teach, there isn't a tap nearby and all those kinds of things. So it just made more sense to me to move over to diamonds and ceramics that I could carry um, some honing fluid with me. So that's what I used to do my sharpening. So to pop this in my, um, um, my honing guide, I can bring you down again. Okay. I spin that round. Do we pop that in there? Not to the edge of the bench. So it is my projection. Bring it up. Okay, so I know now I've that, that is a perfect projection to grind that bevel there at 20 degrees. I put that to one side. 
imagine I've got my, my um, sharpening stone out in front of me, just a little bit of light pressure on the front there, I can go backwards and forwards in a straight line and grind that perfectly every time which to me is just music to my ears. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. It means I don't have to faff about and worry if I'm rounding it over. I know that I can get straight back to that really nice, clean, crisp edge, which makes the whole thing so much more uh, user-friendly, in, in my opinion. And if you want to, I have done it on this one. I've actually taken it up a notch uh, and gone from a 20 degree bevel to put a, a secondary bevel. It's overkill, I know and just gone up from 20 to a 25 degree secondary bevel. You can do it and polish that really nice and shiny. It's not really necessary on, on something like a marking knife, but uh, it just goes to show that it, it is absolutely possible to do it. So that's that's the story of my marking gauge and, uh, and that system of going from um, uh, sort of blades that are difficult to maintain to something that is really quite user-friendly and easy to maintain almost anybody can return that sharp edge um, back to what it was the day uh, the day arrived and that's it brilliant well sweet derek that, that was really really good thank you very much for that um i think that everybody's picked up a lot of tips there that they can uh, either update their own or, or tweak their own or even make their own new ones and uh, I, I see that uh, barbie woodshop is uh, is there online and, and maybe, you know, the challenge could be that you have to make a miniature one for, for, for Barbie. <laughs> what do you reckon? Well, I'll give it some serious thoughts. <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so it's question time now. Um, so if, uh, if you want to ask a question, go down to the bottom of the screen, um, click on the chat and put your name in the chat and then we can, uh, we can put you forward. So I just need to tweak it so that... Uh, everybody can unmute themselves but if you stay muted and unless you ask unless you ask a question so okay so the first one up is is matthias if you'd like to unmute yourself thank you yes good evening everyone um and thank you very much derek that was uh, a very interesting presentation i s sort of I, I i as it were you were saying pretty much exactly what i expected you to say from what you've been saying on your Instagram and so on about your marking gauges. Uh, there are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, when I first I got back into woodworking, more seriously, about two years ago now, and the first marking gauge I bought for myself was a very nice and very fancy one, uh, uh, Matsui. So it's a Japanese one. And it's the kind that has a, a vernier gauge. Yeah, yeah. So you can set it very precisely. You can literally to, to uh, a tenth of a millimeter and exactly the same setting every, every time. Um, I love it in many ways. I don't use it that much anymore. Uh, I mainly use tight marks for the moment, which are also very nice, but I love it for two reasons. One is because it's a cutting gauge and it really stays on track mm -hmm. uh, and particularly when i was first learning to use the marking gauge that was very helpful because as you said uh, as a beginner it's it looks simple but it bloody well isn't uh, and the other thing i really liked about it is uh, the fence as you can see it's quite wide and not at all as as tall as as the tr traditional uh, British or, or European marking gauge tends to be. So one question I wanted to ask you about was, have you experimented with that sort of, of, uh, of a fence? So uh, a more elongated one? Because what I really like about it is the fact that it, it locks very nicely against, against uh, the workpiece. Uh, my answer uh, is, is completely out of sync with your question because it's a short one and it's no. Right. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah. one day I will progress to, to sort of different types, but I, I just, I'm just so in love with that, that shape and yeah. uh, it's something that um, maybe I'll sort of turn, turn my hand to doing other tools in, in, in the future. But for the time being, I certainly haven't got any, any plans to take on the Japanese. Right. Uh, fair enough. Uh, the other thing, I'm in, here I'm more as if we're asking for confirmation because from what it looks like, it looks like it would do what I'm about to ask about. Uh, namely, uh, the blade 
I assume you can turn the blade either way around so that you can have the uh, the bevel towards the fence or away from the fence. Yes. Because the, that, that's the one thing I hate about this one. Mm. Is the fact that it's so lovely to use, but when I'm uh, marking for uh, cutting to uh, width or, or to depth, uh, of course, I, if I use this one, and it's really, it's, it's the nicest one in my workshop for doing that job, except it gives me the beveled side of the cut uh, towards the keeper and not towards the waist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can work around that. You, you set a, a couple of tenths of mil extra on it, and then you plane just past the line, but it's it's less than ideal. Uh, so I, I, I take it that with one like yours, it would be possible to uh, to just turn the blade around and get the bevel the way you want it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they are they are beveled on on one side, so you have got a flat face. So you have you can actually set um, um, you know, yeah, yes. In actual fact, the answer to the question is you could turn it around the other way. But the only thing is, rather than uh, use it, it depends on left or right handed. Rather than use it on the push, you'd have to use it on the pull. Yeah. That, that's the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or you would have to have two blades. Or you'd have to have two blades. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, because uh, I also use uh, the Lee Nielsen uh, honing guide mm -hmm. and, and I recently bought the 98 and 99 uh, uh, rabbit planes or the, the, the ones for cleaning up uh, data walls. Yep. The small bronze ones. And they, uh, those blades come at 30 degree angles because they're a left and right handed pair. I had yep. to get both jaws. Uh, so, so one could, of course, just convert one end of the blade to, to a 30 degree angle in the other direction. Indeed, yes, yeah. yeah. Right, okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna well, shut up now and let everybody else ask their questions. Oh, <laughs> brilliant, thank you, Matthias. I think that's a good idea having the two blades. Um, I think maybe it'd be safer to have two separate because of the size of them. You might end up catching yourself when you're sharpening them. I, I don't know, I mean, it's, I think if I was gonna go, I would have the two blades. Um, Shrenik, over to you. Cheers, Derek. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, yeah, as expected. Um, I think I warned you of one of my questions, but I'm not going to ask that one first. Oh, uh, I was prepared for it as well. Um, I think my, my first question was about the, uh, the, the normal pin marking gauges. And you talked about how you lengthened the, the stem of the, or you had the pin sticking out further. Yep. And what I thought was quite interesting was I've actually found the angle of presentation of the pin makes a difference. And if yep. you're talking about resting the, the marking gauge down on the wood before you present the pin, the, the longer the pin, the, the, that would change the angle of presentation. Have you, have you actually calculated a, an angle which is, which is perfect for the angle of presentation? Or is it just by sort of feel? Uh, Shrek, I'm smirking because no, I haven't. I'm not that precise, to be honest. I mean, it, it was interesting that uh, uh, Matthias mentioned about having a vernier on his, his, his marking gauge. And there, there are certain things in, in woodworking, especially, that kind of make no sense to me, how, how we're sort of fascinated with this idea of precision and measurements. Measurements are, um, are, are numbers that kind of mean very little if it doesn't fit. And the, the best fit is, is the size, you know, is, is, is the finger that goes into the hole. If it fits, it fits. You don't need to know what that measurement is. And just by knowing it's 12.375 doesn't actually help you. And I, I try and teach my students from a very early age, forget about the numbers, just make it fit. And if you use that as your working methodology, it just frees you up to work with that concept. Do the two pieces come together? Will the peg fit the hole? Forget about the measurement. They're not interested in the numbers. It's just going to use up too much RAM and you're just going to, you're just going to, you know, sort of sweat the small stuff, as we say. So keep it simple. Don't worry about the numbers and the angles. Just make it work. And if you can adopt that philosophy, uh, I think you find that woodworking just becomes so much more natural and intuitive the minute you take the numbers out. Now, that's not to say that we don't need numbers at some point. But when it gets really critical, it's much better to aim for a friction fit than it is to aim through a number. I'm actually okay. reading, a, I'm reading a book at the moment, which kind of goes against everything I've just said. And I wanted to bring this in to show everybody is that, of course, it's come out backwards, isn't it? It's um, uh, oh, Simon, 
Simon Winchester. Did somebody you want to see that again? Did somebody say uh, the words? They are the they are the correct way, um, Derek. Oh, is it? Oh, it's yeah, me. It is right, yeah. That yeah. Words to me. Okay. Okay, is this a great book? Um, How precision engineers created the modern world. world. And in his first, uh, in the prologue, in actual fact, I copied it out and put it on my screen over here so I could read a bit out to you, just in case anybody led me down this rabbit hole. Um, and he, he says in his prologue that it can never be, talking about wood that is, it can never be truly of a fixed dimension because its very nature is it is a substance still fixed in the natural world. And I thought that just captured and sums up our relationship with wood as opposed to any other hard material that we can actually get a level of precision out of. You can't achieve it with wood. And I think we're just making our lives even more complicated by kidding ourselves that we can or that it's actually a wise thing to do because what fits today uh, in our sort of 37 degrees temperatures. What am I looking up there? 28 it is in here at the moment. Well, tomorrow it might be 40. It'll be completely different. And I've just put so much blood, sweat and tears getting something to fit to, with, under today's conditions when tomorrow will be a completely different thing. That, that brings me on to my, my Veritas wheel marking gauge, which has got a vernier on it as well. Yeah. And it's got a fine adjustment and, and all sorts. But I think the, the, the biggest problem I have with this, and I think your, your cutting gauge and any cutting gauge really solves that issue completely, is that you can't use it on softwood. It compresses. It doesn't cut. It, doesn't, it won't cut. It won't cut. Okay. Um, pin gauges, in my experience, if you've got the right kind of pin, and uh, I found those gramophone needles work really, really well on softwood. I, um, I make a lot of my, if I can spin that round there, Am I, going the I, right I way? should I should say I'm talking Maybe about not. going across the grain, not not along the grain. Okay, well my uh, the pin gauges are actually quite good for cutting along the grain, especially in softwood. Uh, but they are prone to wandering if the blade, if the pin is vertical. If you can get it over like that and drag it, you've got far more control. It's less likely to sort of wander uh, and come out of the grain. They're not very effective at severing fibers when you're marking across the grain because the pin, there's no cutting it, it's just a point. Um, a, a cutting or a knife style gauge is more likely in my experience to wander when it's going down the grain than it is going across the grain because it's a, it's, it's a knife and it's actually designed to sever fibers and that's what it does quite well cutting across the grain. I would suggest that maybe the angle of presentation you've got um, on your knife gauge it may be giving you problems cutting across I, the I'm, grain. I'm talking maybe. about a wheel, wheel gauge where there's no angle of presentation. It's, and it's you, you find that that gives you problems cutting a, uh, across the grain? On, only on softer woods. Only and, on soft woods? Yeah, it compresses rather than actually slicing the, the okay. wood. Okay, press a bit harder, Shwenit. Give it oh, some it's, belly. It's worse when you press harder. <laughs> Yeah, I would think the opposite, press less hard. Yeah, I think I think I might be pressing too hard. Yeah. I mean, the thing, in actual fact, you, you, sometimes you find that um, there are times when uh, you need to sort of press lightly and build up to, uh, build, build up to a, a deep mark. If you try and do it in one go, um, you know, you, maybe you're sort of losing a certain amount of control, pressing too hard. If you just go over it a few times, a little bit by cutting something with a Stanley knife, it's often better to put your straight edge down, do a few cuts, a few grazes, and then work your way to uh, the depth that you need. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I'm not a huge fan of wheel gauges, uh, mainly Nor because um, uh, one of the last times I used one, I do use them since then, but I, had, I gave my, my thumb the, the worst cut I'd ever had using um, a, a wheel gauge. Put it on the top, slid it towards me, went straight across my thumb, and I thought, that's it. Wheel gauges gone out. Ouch. Don't ask me about mortise gauges. I'm, I've got. I'm very opinionated about mortise gauges as well. <laughs> Someone ask him about that in a minute. Thiago, yeah. over to you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Derek. Thank you very Hello, much. Thiago. Yeah, always oh, nice to see uh, and and to hear you talking. Uh, and and thank you for what you just said. Uh, we are we, we are on the same page. I, I do agree uh, with all you said about uh, a precision in woodworking, and uh, I I do use the same methods uh, that rely more on uh, uh, you know gauging pieces against each other than numbers and you know that that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm biased. It's it's you know not a coincidence that the the project we have here is called uh, knowing by hand. So. <laughs> uh, 
just just uh, another thing uh, uh, thanks for making those uh, uh, gauges the way you make them they, they are so inviting to the hand i i i could uh, see the one you brought to kentucky uh, last year and uh, that's uh, really important when you, when you deal with with hand tools and not all hand tools are made that way they uh, in my opinion so well, thanks for that as well. Just a quick question uh, about the knob, the side knob, the, the locking knob. Uh, you just, uh, the thread in there and, and the, uh, you just use a tap. Is that how, how you make them and, and what's the size of it? Um, I get, um, things on now. The first ones I had, I used to use um, uh, um, uh, a box thread. And I used to get these these turned up about that long when my, I've got a wood turner. Uh, down on the industrial estate where the engineering is and I, I love using local craftsmen and loves um, sort of trade um, trades you know so working with different trades uh, I'm not a wood turner. I could probably work out how to do one of these on a lathe to be perfectly honest it would take me forever to, to you know to spin out 30 or 40 of these whereas the guy down the road just does wood turning all day every day we do these in his lunch hour uh, and not only that I like the idea of supporting one man and his lathe who's actually trying to, you know, eke a living out of being a woodworker. So I'm happy to support them. And then, you know, when I go back to uh, the days when I first started, my, you know, I think it was 1982, I got my first job as a Saturday boy in, in a restoration workshop. Um, within a sort of square half mile of the workshop, we had um, a spray centre, you know, uh, people doing polishing, which was just down the road. We had a guy in two streets down that way, used to do the wood turning there was a glazier just around the corner in that direction. And if I just sort of ventured, a, you know, sort of a few streets beyond, there were more turners and wood turners and upholsterers uh, and glaziers. And, and, you know, okay, so Brighton was, um, had a, a thriving um, sort of industry in sort of restoration and furniture making and making reproduction furniture. So there was this, there was this trade existed. And I really liked the idea of going to specialists. I mean, there was a guy, who was uh, a chair maker. His name was Derek. Uh, I never met anybody else called Derek, and, you know, fortunately, but, um, or surprisingly, but his name was Derek and he was a chair maker. And that's all he did. And that was quite unusual back then for me to go, you make, all you do is make chairs. You don't make chests of drawers. No, just make chairs. And I thought, Jesus, that's a bit boring. I mean, I know quite a few chair makers now and I wouldn't say it to their face, but you know, then you realize that he could actually turn out chairs, bang, 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 really efficiently. And that's how, that's how he managed to keep a roof over, he said. And, uh, and, and these kids in private school by being, by being a chair maker. But he was a really, really quick and fast turner. And he just knew all the shapes, never worked off a template. You just say, I want this, I want a little bit bigger there. And he just kind of knew, yes, Derek, I know what you need. It's Victorian. Said, well, okay, if you say it's Victorian, it's Victorian. And he'd just go and turn out the legs you need and they'd all be perfect. And it's fantastic. So yes, I, I love that idea of, of, of sort of using lo local tradesmen to, um, uh, to sort of turn stuff out for you. But yes, to answer your question, I get these spun out by the box load and I use um, uh, a thread box to cut them. Um, it's a little bit wasteful because you can never guarantee uh, that every single one of these will turn out perfect. And what I have to do, if they're that long, I start the first part of the thread with a box cutter and then very, very carefully, you shouldn't really do this, is wind it back off. Take the base of your thread box. You know, I really should have got a box cutter out uh, to show you. I wasn't expecting to talk about threading, but um, is to take the uh, the exit part or uh, or the, the the lead box off of the cutter and then run it without it because you've actually got enough thread for uh, the little tip or, or the cutter to find that thread, and then you can get right down to the hilt. If you didn't take half of the the box thread cutter off, you'd only be able to get a thread down to about there, and that would never be a thread. Um, and then that way your 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 knob <clears throat> on, on your gauge would always stick out about that far. Now, the reason the knob is round and not squished down, and most traditional marking gauges, that knob is usually a T-shape. And it may just be me, but I found it really irritating if when I turn my marking gauge and tighten that up, if that wasn't clocked, damn, it used to annoy me. And I think if I just go a little bit further, I can get it up to 90 degrees and it'll all line up and then there'll be, you know, I, I could relax a little bit, but it never happens. Um, so I just decided rather than do that and pass that, um, all that aggravation and that unpleasant feeling onto everybody else, I just kept it simple and made it round. And okay, it does look a little bit chunky, a bit large, but in actual fact, 
it's really handy to wrap your fingers around whether you're using it that way or, or using it this way. It just, you know, you can put your thumb on there, you can get plenty of, of leverage and it just works quite nicely. So does that answer your question about threading? Sure, yes, thank Good. you so much. And, uh, and now you've proved my point about making things that are inviting to the hand because if you have that knob sticking out too much, it's not as, you know, that pleasant to use. Just, uh, you don't play guitar, do you? I haven't played guitar for about 20 years. So okay, the answer because to that is no, I don't play guitar. <laughs> okay, I'm restoring that. It's just a little. Uh, oh God, I forgot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The key. Yeah, it's a tuning key. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you can't you, you cannot clock these on a guitar. You know, it's it, it's just that would drive you nuts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Thiago. Um, right, Chester, over to you. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Um, yeah. Can you hear me all right? We can hear yep, you. Yep, we can hear you, Chester. Yep, yep. Hey, Derek, that was great. That's great. And that, those are some beautiful marking gauges. Um, uh, my questions for you are, uh, first, staying with that threaded portion, I, I, you don't seem to have a pressure plate, or at the end of that, did it have a little pad of cork? Do you have something? Uh, a little bit your... of leather. Don't hold that. Yep, it's got a tiny bit of leather on there. Okay, that answers that question. Yeah. I was wondering if you had anything to protect the. Uh, yeah. that. So I, I, I just uh, I stick that little, tiny little bit of leather on there with uh, with hide glue, obviously, and that's what sticks the two together. So right. uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. So that, that stops you bruising it. What wood are you using? Is that are those boxwood or are they? Um... No, in actual fact, it, it's a wood called. Uh, it's commonly referred to as lemon wood, which is, um, I think it's Castello box or something like that. It comes from, I believe, Paraguay. Uh, it's very popular with luthiers, I'm told, um, and it's a little. It's like a poor man's boxwood, uh, and you can buy it much, much easier than you can get uh, long commercial lengths or, or repeated sort of size components in in boxwood. It's a bit cheaper than boxwood, nowhere near as hard but it's got that same really um, sort of tight grain that you can get great definition on there. If you've ever done any carving with lime, it feels a little bit like working lime that's very, very hard. You can get super definition on there. Um, it looks like boxwood, it behaves like boxwood, and, and I'm not too sure what luthiers use it for, um, but it, it is it's hard enough to make a good marking gauge out of, that's for sure. Very yeah. nice. And the other thing is that when you were showing using the sharpening guide, the offset of your blade to the center of the wheel seemed yep. inordinately distanced. And I'm wondering is when you're using that and you're putting that pressure out there, what is your wheel riding on? Do you have a very wide plate that you're sharpening on? Or, I'll or show you, Chester, I'll, I'll show you. Okay. I'll bring it down. All right, that's my stone. If I still got it set in its goes, I've got that on there. So there's the wheel. So it does fit. Does fit, yeah. Then what I do, I tend to work around like that. So you can run up the side. You always spin these around. It's the same as going up the other side. So yes, you can, yeah. And these aren't um, particularly wide. We've got to take measure here. Let's yeah, I think it just looked, it looked because of the camera that it was. Yeah, really it probably does look as if it goes way out there, but no, it, the whole thing does ride quite nicely within uh, the, the width of a, one of these, these are standard ones. Yeah, 75 mil, yeah. In, uh, in your language, that's just under three inches, Chester. Right, right, very nice. Thank yeah. you for the presentation there. You're welcome. Beautiful. You. Where are they available? Where are they available? You have to send, send, <laughs> send me a message, Chester. Okay. I will. You know how to find me. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Should be unplugged woodworkers, you know, unplugged. <laughs> um, right. Uh, next question is from Mike. Mike Tupper. Hello. Mike. How Hello. are you, Derek? I'm fine. How are you? I'm sensational, thanks. That's good. Uh, it's my That's first good. time on. And actually, sadly, the question that I had when you were present, uh, presenting has just been answered because you held the gauge up. And I was just going to ask where uh, the marking knife comes through. Is the stock square or rounded? And you've just held it up to show 
it is rounded. It's not just the pin that has a rounded where you roll the pin into the timber to mark it. Roll the timber. No, so the, these these gauges are, are rounded. They're all rounded. They're all rounded like that, yeah. It's purely a visual thing, so you can actually see exactly what the uh, the cutting edge is doing, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember, I, I, I teach joinery at the IBTC and it's interesting, a couple of things that you uh, mentioned. Sometimes when I have guys come in, you mentioned about sharpening, how the, it is the means to an end, where sharpening is now an industry in itself. And it, uh, I always tell the guys right on day one, that exactly what you've said, and I feel a bit of a outcast for saying it, because you see people putting away fancy sharpening jigs and thinking, shit, mm. I better not bring this out. He's just said, yeah. but it is, it's a means to make something rather than an industry in itself. And I think people do get very caught up yeah. in just the sharpening. So that was interesting. But the thing about the marking gauge and particularly the marking knife that uh, particularly interests me on an instruction side you touched on it slightly, but I think one of the biggest problems that I encounter in the first week with students is not the planing or taking stock down to size. It's actually using a marking and mortise gauge. Ooh. And they start using a mortise gauge and it runs off all over the place. And uh, you could try and say, well, it's got to be more pressure this way. And you do end up with inverted train tracks that are so deep so it is beautiful to see a uh, a knife marking gauge which can be so much more gentle uh particularly we make a lot of boxes and stuff um mm. for the shoulder lines of dovetails it would be perfect just to cut those fibers so they know exactly where they're going in with the shoulders of their dovetails so yeah, yeah. It's an absolute pleasure to see, and it has been interesting first night on to see such an interesting talk. Yes, I've, I've seen your boxes, um, Mike. They're fantastic. The ones you make with your, your students up at, uh, up at the college. Yeah, there's a couple they make. One is the big tool chest that is, if you like, the trademark yeah. of the college. And the other one is a joiner's attache case. It basically is, they're all handmade out of, um, we take sawn mahogany. And the whole thing is, is to learn the hand skills, not... Uh, although it is a lovely thing to do, but not to be able to sort of show off about it. It's because when people move on to make boats, yeah. there are no power tools to do it because everything is compound curves. It yeah, has yeah. to be done block planes and spoke shaves. Yeah. So we've got to get people really thinking, no, we, I mean, obviously we do use power tools, but don't rely on the power tools. Uh, something that you actually mentioned earlier this evening is sometimes when you were saying about water, for example, you can be in areas working on boats, and I'm not going to mention water and boats, uh, <laughs> uh, but you have no power and things like that. So it, it, the hand tools are the go-to things that you have to pick up and work. Um, yeah, yeah. And so they have to teach that. And the box, making the boxes, uh, also teaches repetition because there's loads of dovetails in them. And it's to get people's heads around that, you know, doing a dovetail isn't doing uh, two dovetails and saying, I've mastered this. It's, it's doing tens of them and all coming yeah, out. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it really does hone the eye in and everything. So, yeah, that's what I do. So. I, I think, Mike, Mike that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I've seen one of your boxes and the, the quality of the box and the finish that you put on it with the, the yacht varnish that you have and the many coats, that they, they look absolutely amazing. Um, for, for those of you that um, maybe don't know Mike, um, uh, when he said IBTC, um, basically that's the International Boat Building Training College in, in Lower Stoff. And, and Mike and, and Lynn, um, you know, run the setup there, they run the college there. Um, it's, it's an absolutely amazing place. Um, I, I'm going to do a bit of a bully here. You, you've kind of, you, you've warmed everybody up with this box, this uh, Boat Builders Travelling Tool Chest. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe next week you could come on and talk to us and tell us all about it and show us your box. I'd, I'd obviously have to check my diary for a Thursday night at, uh, uh, at what time are we, 8.30 or 9.30. But I've reached an age where Thursday nights tend to be quite empty anyway, to be honest. So, no, I mean, if, if you're happy, I mean, I, I, um, whether I could talk the 20 minutes about the box, I probably can. But if you'd like to see some boats as well in the workshop, I'll be delighted to throw a camera around and show you. Uh, I think you've got lots of thumbs up there. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, so, like so ne next week, Bench Talk 101 is, is with yourself. Come, I, I will start doing my homework now. I better find out what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I'll be Thank delighted. you.
Jeffrey, I'll be delighted to. Uh, th thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. No uh, worries. Okay, so on to the next question then. We've got Jim. Jim Hendricks. Hello, Jim. Watcher, watcher, watcher. Excellent. Hey, e excellent, mate. Excellent. I, I just wanted to pop on and say, right, this, this somebody made this, and I don't know who it was. <laughs> it's not signed, and, is it, that one? And, and you, you, actually, you actually managed to justify my love of Ikea by giving me the one with the Ikea pencil, you see. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a limited batch, I think. <laughs> a, a limited edition, but it is absolutely... Can you remind me what, what the... Is it Snakewood? No, it, it's Rupala. Oh, right. Okay. Rupala. No idea where it comes from. No idea what its Latin name means. I just only ever know it as Rupala. I'm, I'm not nerdy about, about woods and all those kinds of things. I just, you know, if, they're, if I'm attracted to them, then, um, then they'll, they'll go into the mix. It is, it is one of the ones that I use when I'm doing the big stuff, because it obviously compared with, as you said, you know, compared with um, yeah. a normal marking gauge, it is, uh, but it is a superbly made thing. It's lethal. This, this <laughs> gramophone pin, I just picked it out of, the, out of my English wood chest and I grabbed it like that, forgetting that it had a pin on the end and yeah, I just yeah, yeah. stabbed myself. Um, I, go, I agree with you about wheel marking gauges and that leads me on to something because I've never ever got on with them uh, I understand that type mark is um, is one that, that, that does work and it is good I suppose it's down to tolerances and running of the wheel and uh, various other maybe the materials made of it but generally speaking I, I, I st stay well clear of them because they, they tend to track in my opinion and I just never got used to them um, but on the subject of um, of the profile of the cutters, and this this is something that um, some time ago I had a big discussion with uh, Douglas Coates of Coates England, you know the vices. Yeah, hi, Douglas, um, yeah. yeah, he and I had a, a long, long chat uh, about the the profile of of and type of cutter, and this went on for weeks, and we prototyped because I was making a, a lignum vitae and brass uh, cutting gauge and um, similar to the one that you're making now with a wedge, but we, we went through an iteration of uh, various cutters from, from the pin to a, to a knife similar to your, similar to your marking knife. Um, we came to the conclusion that generally speaking in long grain and across the grain, that the original one that you showed right at the very beginning, the uh, which got on the Holt staff for you see this one's got a vernier on it, remember? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. The the cutter on this is from the Holt staff for is the same. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, rounded, uh, very shallow, single-sided um, bevel cutter. So I copied it for this. If you remember, I, I made this a couple of weeks ago, mm. um, but. Without question, this is the conclusion we came to with the prototype, that this is the very, very best all around um, marking gauge cutter because it doesn't have any di uh, direction. So it, it will cut in both directions. It severs the, uh, it severs the, um, uh, the fibers across the grain. Is, it, is this the conclusion you're coming to now? Because if I remember rightly, you, you started off with the rounded um, cutter and now you're moving to a 20 degree knife I, I i don't know whether or not i i totally agree with that as a left-handed person every time i pick one up it's in the wrong direction but yeah. can you comment on what you I because it is actually a very it's a complex subject um and i i think it it, it warrants some thought about um the merits of each one and what your conclusion was and why you've gone from from a, a rounded bevel to a, to a knife yeah um rounded bevel to a knife i i i found that with uh, admittedly that was just made out of a, a hacksaw blade and i do find with my where did i put it i've only got a small workshop and i've lost my marking gauge already but the uh, the hamilton tools one so it's got a tiny little round blade on it uh, and I've got one of his, um, what he calls a traditional marking gauge as well. And that's got the same kind of blade. It, it's rounded at the end. And for me, they tended to perform a little bit like a wheel gauge. 
uh, in that they, you know, I often found that they would, they would sort of track where I didn't want them to go. Uh, and then when I was looking at cutting gauges, traditional cutting gauges, I, just, I was just looking for the perfect angle. Uh, and of course, there isn't a perfect angle. It's just the angle that I used a marking knife if I was holding my knife and up against, we'll come back here, you can see whatever angle that is that I'm cutting at. I thought, well, if that's the angle that <coughs> I'm setting my knife to cut, then surely that's got to be the most appropriate angle for a cutting gauge. So I just took my hand out of the way, put a marking gauge in its place, and hey presto, that's the angle that kind of works, which you know, was the, I, I found just, um, was the most efficient at cutting. Um, and also I felt that it tied in, I'm back again, it tied in quite nicely with an ability to re-grind and resharpen everything. Um, and that's something that uh, I'm not sure that I would be capable of doing repeatedly to a, a standard that would allow me to go to bed and, and sort of leave this on the side and I'll come back and tackle that tomorrow. I know that um, I'd always struggle. I'd have to go to a, a tool maker or grinder or something to, to reshape that or, or just be, you know, put that down again or just be uh, content with grinding the back to get it sharp again. At least that way with a, with a straight edge, I know that I can actually sharpen the bevel in a controlled manner and I can also flatten the back in a controlled manner. It was a combination of those two factors really, being able to return it back to a nice sharp edge uh, and something that I felt was akin to how I use a marking gauge in, in everyday life. I, I'm, I'm wondering if it's down to not necessarily the difference between the two of those, but the thickness of the actual cutter itself, because a lot, all of the, all of the very good ones I've found are in the, are quite thick. Um, I, I know Holt Sapfel uses one that's three millimeters thick. Wow. Um, and, um, quite a lot of the ones that I've had that, uh, I've prototyped have been out of two to three millimeter, uh, O1 steel and then hardened myself in the kitchen sort of thing. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering the tracking aspect of the of the of the rounded bevel might be down to using the thin one and therefore it flexes rather than cuts and the knife doesn't really matter because it's cutting in uh, you know the the classic example of that is is a Stanley blade isn't it so yeah. um I'm just yeah so that was that was my question and just quickly on there is the there's a different talking about vernier and i as a tool maker rather than a, a a general you know doing carpentry um i find that i do need to use accuracy to to that sort of uh, extent and that's another reason why i use principally boxwood and other very very hard exotic woods because i like the precision both of the of the of the uh the fact that it, change in its characteristics very much even with temperature or time um if it's seasoned correctly obviously um there's a difference between vernier and i think what shrenik was talking about which was the veritas is the micro adjustment which even if you're going for a friction fit and it doesn't matter what what the, what the measurements are surely and this is where i'm looking into now I'm trying to find a way of getting a gauge and somebody said, somebody actually mentioned it on the whole staff for one. Can you, can you put a micro adjustment on it? Um, and that's my, my next, uh, should we say goal apart from the wheel ones. Have you seen any with any micro adjustment on them at all? Has the Hamilton one got one? No, no, I, I can't say I have actually, Jim. Um, I haven't seen any traditional sort of gauges with a micro adjust. And I think that is one of the uh, uh, the nicer features on those Veritas wheel gauges is that micro adjust at the end. Uh, and I would probably, I use that more in actual fact as almost like a, a, um, a depth gauge to sort of gauge depths of holes. And if I've got timber on the side, I want to know how thick it is rather than string a tape across or measure it across. I probably just, you know, sort of use it almost like um, um, a vernier gauge. Now, Chester is holding a gauge up. Um, if we can go to if you, Chester, if you take yourself off mute, we can hear you talk about that gauge that you're holding up. There. Um, well, it's not completely a micro adjust. It's a it's a Stanley uh, boxwood mortising gauge with a double cutter. 
And um, I don't know if I'm holding that up in the right place for you to see the cutter. It's over here. Oh yeah, it's at the at the end. I've got I've got one like that. Yeah, yeah. that adjusts so, that adjusts the pins, doesn't it? So it has a threaded rod going through it rather than yeah. the wheel. And then um, and then what that does is it pulls just this brass piece in the center. But that's for adjusting the width of the mortise, though. Right. So one is one is stable. And yeah. the inside one can go in and out. But if you wanted to use this as a as a system for doing the whole sample, all you have to do is eliminate this outside stagnant one, and you can then adjust the pin in and out. Uh, well, yeah, sure. but that would take the registration out because the vernier relies upon the registration of the pin being fixed. Right, you'd have to change it. Yeah, you got. You're going to have to move. The, you yeah the moving of the pin isn't isn't an option it has to be moving of the head jim jim you ah, could attach yeah. it to the you could attach it to the actual head, head. Yeah. yeah so you could attach that brass bar to the head and then it yeah, would that bar. would move with the yeah do you want me to send this to you, you could take part and use it uh, i've got i've got one i've got one yeah i've got exactly come, come yeah. back to the um come back to that subject of, of mortise gauges I, um, I'm really not a fan of those mortise gauges. I, I find that um, the mechanisms always bind up uh, and I'm not convinced that wood and metal is a very good marriage in most cases. If, we, if you look at how metal engages with wood in terms of locks and hinges and handles and all that sort of hardware we put into our furniture, if you look at period furniture, that's always where furniture gives up. It's where, it's where the timber um, uh, starts to um, sort of um, deform and, and break away. Whenever you put anything metal close to, to wood, that's where you kind of introduce um, an element of um, uh, obsolescence, I think. And by putting a mechanism in, in those, those mortared gauges, and I think the nicer ones, are they made out of rosewood or, or some sort of very sort of hard, dense wood? Or, yeah, or maybe one yeah. Ebony. Ebony, ebony, some of them, I think. Yeah, they always, in the ones that I've, and maybe they're great on day one, but um, uh, further down, you know, in, in time, they always seem to um, sort of lose their um, their efficiency. They're just, you know, just bind up after a while. So not a, not a good choice, in, in my opinion. I don't like them. And Derek, that Rupala is leopard wood from Australia. It's similar to silky oak, but it's, uh, it's the common name is leopard wood. Leopard wood. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. Brilliant. So we've got uh, Anthony up next. Anthony. Hi, Derek. <laughs> Hi, Anthony. Um, I'm very new to woodworking, so I'm using the basic, you know, rubbish, cheap, nasty gauges. We can see it. Yep. I don't warrant buying a Veritas. It's very expensive, especially yep. if when you're going to change it. Is there a sort another way of sharpening? Is no there way. another way of sharpening? Oh, crikey. Um, I, I don't actually sort of worship at the um, um, at the, the, the altar of, of whetstones like some people do. To me, I, I, it's just something that has to be tackled. I'm probably not the best person to ask about lots of different sharpening techniques, but that um, eclipse that you've just held up there, if it's a, a proper eclipse and not a cheap, yes. if, it is a proper eclipse. It is an eclipse, yeah. Okay. Well, you can, and I used to have one kicking around here. I have, I think I've got one. I'm digging down on the bench. Okay, right, I got a funny feeling this, this was something that I, I mucked about with, with a friend of mine who, who is in the same position as you, can't afford a, um, a Veritas or a Lee Nielsen, he just used an, an Eclipse. So I made him up um, a couple of these jigs and that's a really quick and easy way of setting those depth. I think can't move PC 30. Plain iron, I can't, I don't know what the piece and all they, they were for, but you can make one of these up as a depth stop for the two different sizes um, for your planes. I think there's two different settings, isn't there, on the clips for memory surgeons, one for yeah. planes and one for chisels, yeah. yeah. So you can set that up to, to make it much easier so you can actually get repeatable. And that's the beauty of using a honing die and some kind of system is that you, you can go back to the same angle again and again, whereas if you freestyle, um, the tendency is to round them over unless you sharpen regularly all day, every day, then you get really good at it. I don't, you know. I, I, Unfortunately, I'm a turner, so I have to sharpen quite a lot. To really oh, well, you do, do most of your turning, presumably, on, on some kind of grinder, would you? You're not doing those by I hand. do. I, I have, well, I have, well, 
show you. I have a yeah, bench yeah. grinder here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the top, I've got a big belt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I use both of them all the time. But yeah. Uh, but I, the other thing I asked was, I was going to ask about is I have the very cheap Veritas style wheel. Yeah. Now, I've noticed with benefits of that, when you're marking, you can go backwards and forwards. With yeah. your style gauge, it seems like it's restricted just to the draw. It is, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, whichever you're more comfortable doing, pushing or, or pulling, that's that's the blade I would have in at that time. Or you can use, you know, that one there that will allow you to go in both directions, which is okay. quite convenient. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I've, I've been using it. I haven't found it. I just get used to not being able to push and pull. If I make all my 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 sort of my cuts going in one direction, that's it. One direction. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I say I'm totally new to it, so I, I find the benefit I've been able to draw forward and backwards over just the single drawback is a lot more comfortable. Good. I, I, I thought Derek was then was going to ask for your address and send over this uh, jig that you could have. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, I mean, it's, only, it's, it's gathering dust under my bench, so if you want to drop me a direct message, I'll, I'll tune it up for um, an eclipse. Well, then, as a fact, you tell me what the angles are. Uh, what those measurements are from the edge, you know, what, what the protrusion is for. Um, or just send me a picture. It's usually engraved or embossed on the side of the, the body. Yeah. Of the tool, I think. So, yeah, I think it's just okay. engraved just here. Yeah, so send me a close-up picture so I can read it, and I'll gladly put that in the post. You No problem at all. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, Derek. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm, 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 yeah, you may have noticed I'm getting rid of some stuff this week. I've got rid of a, lo a load of kit that I just don't need to. Absolutely. So we got we got a question from Barbie Woodshop. Um, obviously, we know that Barbie's shy um, and uh, doesn't want to talk on here, but uh, Barbie's here. She said, uh, "Could you tell me more about the wedge and have you considered using a wedge with a pencil?" A wedge with a pencil. How would I use a wedge with a pencil? Bobby, I believe you, you dropped your phone last week and you're having problems using it. So presumably that's, that's still at the, at the mender. So I understand why your reluctance to actually to speak to it. So um, have I tried a wedge with a pencil? No, short answer to that. Um, I'm, I'm quite, I quite like my, the, the ability to sort of fine tune it and sort of take the pencil backwards, you know, uh, up and down. I mean, that's become a bit of a, not, not a signature, but it, it, it's something I enjoy as a feature I have on my, on my gauges, which I'm quite happy with. Um, and Wedge, the Wedge, if you, you were with us last week, I think, when we were talking to Phil uh, about Wedges, the Wedge is an incredibly efficient means of of um, sort of fastening things in place. There's a moth buzzing around here. It's going to fly on my screen in a minute, I think. But um, uh, again, I like the shape of a put that where you can actually see it. I love the shape of a traditional old wedge. It's a lot of faffing about to get to that point. But for me, it's worth every broken blade to get to that point. And I would urge you, if, you're, if you really enjoy a shape or, or an aspect of anything you're making, it really is worth pursuing it. Because whenever I make one of these wedges uh, and I put it down, I, it does make me smile. It makes me warm inside. I think, do you know that? That was worth it. My arm aches, my wrist aches, and I haven't got a sharp tool on, on, on the rack, but I've made a, a beautiful wedge. And um, that, that gives me a buzz. And if I can pass that on to somebody else, then that's absolutely fine. So I use the wedges because they're fun to make and I, I like the outcome. Um, I'm not going to be able to retire on making wedges, but hey, you know, if, um, I've got a pension for that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or well, you can carry on doing courses. There we are. I can so, carry on um, doing courses, yeah. yeah. De Derek, um, you, you've been here now for a, a, an hour and a quarter. Yeah. Um, you've been absolutely amazing sharing all of your, your, your tricks and your tips. Um, you've had everybody captivated. Thank you very much for, for, for doing it, Derek. So yeah, you're more than welcome anytime. If you could all raise your glass and uh, toast to the bench and to Derek. Derek and Here's the bench. <laughs> it's a high tech conversation. And the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.